Spotlight is proudly sponsored by HEC Media, St. Louis's home for arts, education, and culture. There's something fascinating about this person we think we know trying to become that person. All of these artists are rock stars in their own element. That's half of what sells these items, is the story. Today on Spotlight, rethink the party dress, where you can see fashion from acclaimed area designers. Plus, SLU offers an online cannabis class, which now includes a graduate program. And then one watercolor artist makes her creations different and meet a wood sculptor who starts projects at the sawmill. But first, a book about a debutante turned icon named Jackie Kennedy. It's Sunday and you're watching the multiple Emmy Award winning Spotlight. Before the pillbox hats and Valentino gowns and White House tours, before becoming a Kennedy and long before becoming the wife of a Greek billionaire, there was a young career woman named Jacqueline Bouvier. In the 1950s, before she became that Jackie, Jacqueline Bouvier worked as the inquiring camera girl for a Washington, D.C. newspaper. She was courted by a handsome young congressman from Massachusetts, Jack Kennedy. Author Louis Byard's new work of fiction, Jackie and Me, is narrated by a close friend of the Kennedy family, Lem Billings. Lem was a closeted gay man and Jack's close friend. The Kennedys enlisted him to screen Jackie as a potential wife for Jack. He's the one who's tasked with befriending her and cultivating her and encouraging her to, to stay on, even when Jack is gone for long stretches of time. He's the one saying, no, this, this'll work out. Jackie and Me is a surprising portrait of a witty and opinionated young woman and a story of love, friendship, and betrayal. This is the Jackie before she became all those other Jackies, the, um, the wife, the first lady in the pillbox hat and the, the widow with the beautiful children, the wife to the Greek tycoon, the um, paparazzi magnet familiar to so many generations of tabloid readers, and I was one of them, I will admit that, um, or the, the, the professional book editor or the style icon. This is the Jackie before that. And she's this still uncertain, still liminal specimen who hasn't quite figured out who she is or what she's going to be doing or what her life is about. And there's something fascinating about that, this person we think we know trying to become that person. And what was she like before that, before she hardened into this, this public figure? And that was a really fun challenge to rediscover her because she's been lost to time. She's so mythologized, right? and the book opens with almost a poignant moment of Lem seeing her. She was, by that time, Jackie Kennedy Onassis, I believe. She is that person that you can no longer touch or reach. She is inaccessible. She has created these barriers, both in her life where she lives, but also her persona is, is kind of a barricade against invasion. Of course, there were paparazzi photographers who were trying to break it, but she had learned by then to kind of keep that part of herself um, defended against scrutiny. And Lem is looking at her from the perspective of 1981. He's an old man now, or at least well into his 60s. And he's, it, it reminds him of all the things that passed um, in their joint history, beginning in 1951 when they first met and then carrying through uh, to the present day. They've had a good run, interesting run together, uh, but they're currently estranged, and the book tries to explain how that happened. Your book is fiction, but it reads almost as if it's nonfiction, but you're imagining conversations. Mm -hmm. How did you re research this? How did you come up with knowing what people might have said in some of these scenarios? It's a two-part process. One is the research. You, I spend at least three or four months up front just researching the basic lay of the land just so I know what I'm doing. And then I start writing the book and the book tells me what I still need to know, which is often considerable. And I never feel that I become a true expert on any of these people. I'm not a Kennedy expert, I'm not an expert in Lincoln or anything I've ever written about. But I learn enough to be able to conjure something. And then the story itself takes over. And they become, in effect, though they begin as real-life characters, they become, for my purposes, fictional characters, which means they have the liberty, they have the autonomy to do or say whatever they want to say or whatever I want them to say. So um, at that point, then, I can then do what novel, novelists always do or fiction writers always do, which is 
forge an empathic bridge between me and them and figure out, okay, what is going on in their heads right now? What are they thinking? What would they be saying in these moments? And that to me is, is the glory of fiction, is being able to go there in a way that a, a more formal historian couldn't. To hear about his book being adapted as a Netflix show, watch the full interview at hecmedia.org. Scan the QR code on your screen to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. So we're at the Foundry Art Center in our main galleries, and we have two fabulous exhibitions going on right now. Rethinking the Party Dress by St. Louis artist Amy Firestone Rosen, and STL STC, which is an exhibition of all area fashion designers. So these two exhibitions complement each other very nicely. You have Amy's work, which is very textural and deals with fashion. She's actually creating prints from actual vintage party dresses, and that mirrors the fashion that is in STL STC, where we have actual texture and fabrics and everything that goes along with fashion. So when you visit the Foundry and you walk through the exhibition, you'll first see Amy Firestone Rosen's artwork. And she's dealing with pattern and texture and sustainability too, which is kind of an overarching thread that runs through both exhibitions. So she's creating these beautiful large scale prints from vintage party dresses. She's actually going and thrifting these items and she uses the dresses themselves as plates to create her very large scale prints and collages. And then you also see really big, beautiful flowing banners that have been created from the prints and the mixed media that she works with. So Amy is really exploring texture and the play on color and fabric and different choices within the fashion lexicon. But she's also making us think a little bit more about uh, sustainability and not using things that are fresh and raw materials, things like that, but also things that are reused and how we can do that within fashion. As you walk through the galleries, you'll then be greeted by STL STC, which is a fashion exhibition by area designers. So we have Michael Drummond, AJ Tovino, both of which are from the St. Louis, St. Charles region and were featured on Project Runway. We also have Mary Crozier from Vogier, who creates beautiful crowns that were featured in all kinds of magazines such as Essence and Allure and has been worn by Angela Bassett and a whole bunch of other famous celebrities. We have a very interesting conceptual work by Leonard Stewart of Stew3. He's dealing with sustainability and you can click on a QR code and you get to understand how much water it takes to make just a t-shirt and what are some ways that we can alleviate the impact on the environment by the choices we make with our fashion. We also have Ajo Hansu of Tribe 228 who creates these beautiful, luxurious pieces of clothing that she's utilizing fabrics from her native Togo. And then rounding out our exhibition, we have Brock Seals, another up-and-comer in the St. Louis region. And we have painted jackets and shoes, everything from adult shoes to little tiny baby shoes. So one of the important elements of the exhibitions that we host at the Foundry is showcasing the regional talent that the St. Louis, St. Charles region has. Uh, we have so much talent right here. And all of these artists are rock stars in their own element. And they're all celebrities to one extent or another, which is really impressive. And I think when visitors walk through, they'll be taken aback just a little bit because they'll realize, hey, these people are on TV. These people are in national, international publications. And they're creating work right here in the St. Louis region, which is really, really cool. So these exhibitions will be open through September 23rd, and you can learn more on our website at foundryartcenter.org. HEC Media, supporting and promoting the arts. Check out our features and shows on theater, dance, music, the visual arts, and more. Find this and all our award-winning content at hecmedia.org. With many months of booming medical marijuana sales in Missouri and thousands of workers flocking to the industry, St. Louis University identified a need for educating a rapidly growing workforce. This trio is getting the word out about cannabis education at St. Louis University, how it's helping people get jobs and changing lives. Well, the class that I teach is cannabis pharmacology. 
I'm a naturopathic doctor. I'm also adjunct professor, general manager of a cannabis dispensary. So just learning in an open setting is helping to reduce the stigma. One of the reasons this plant is, is still kind of in the shadows is just because we don't know it. It has not been available to study it in a science format because it's been illegal. So just learning that there is a program that's offering very extensive training now is a way to release the stigma. SLU School of Professional Studies is offering a one-year Cannabis Science and Operations Certificate program with courses to be taken online for anyone interested. Jeff Rouse is one of the first students to receive a certificate. And in this series of videos, I'll provide some tools that will help you function better as a team member within your dispensary. He's now thriving in the business, building a name for himself at the Field State Cannabis Dispensary in Florissant. He says he's helping people here, and he's growing an online audience and building connections throughout the industry through his show called The Feels. Welcome to The Feels here live at Field State in Florissant, Missouri. It, it's because of the class. It's because of the program. It opened doors for me I never would have been able to open for myself. That's the goal. Stacy Godlewski is the Director of Cannabis Science and Operations at the School of Professional Studies at St. Louis University. Legalized cannabis is expected to be an estimated $150 billion industry within the next three years. As medical and recreational marijuana continue to be legalized in additional states and a possibility of full legalization of marijuana in Missouri's future, Godlewski believes the program is needed. I want people who are passionate about medical cannabis and helping people get better, helping them move away from opioids. Um, people who want to help their mom, their dad, their uncle, themselves. Uh, but people who want to legitimize this industry is who I want in my program because that's what we're doing. SLU's Cannabis Science and Operations Undergraduate Certificate is for people wanting to learn about the business side of things and the science. The science and the operations, so the fundamentals of cannabis, extraction, cultivation, pharmacological properties of medical cannabis, and then compliance and dispensing. For Rouse, it prepared him to take a leadership role. It's because of the knowledge that I'm able to present to patients on the sales floor. I just seem to be the go-to guy in the dispensary whenever there's a cannabis question about anything. They come to me. And SLU offers a medical cannabis science and therapeutic management graduate certificate. We have a focus and a need for doctors, nurses, educators, law enforcement, social workers in the medical cannabis science and uh, therapeutic management program. Uh, folks who work with people who self-medicate with medical cannabis on a daily basis for whatever their ailment may be so that they can teach those folks about the therapeutic benefits. There's a need for the doctors and nurses to understand the synergies between medical cannabis, CBD, and any medications they're on. It's important because it is now medical in the state, any state where you have medical cannabis, I think it's important for doctors to at least learn and understand the inner workings and the possibility of how this can be a great assistant to patients. And learning does not necessarily mean that the doctor becomes an advocate. So I'm also understanding of a doctor saying I don't support it, but if they learn more about it, then they can make an informed choice as opposed to just negating it because the information is, is lacking. And Godlewski says by having an educational program they can offer to many different people, St. Louis University is fulfilling its Jesuit mission. Are we giving good research? Are we having the industry experts teach that rigorous curriculum? Um, another part of the Jesuit mission is making education widely available to everybody, not just folks who can afford it. Using refurbished materials on old homes later on Spotlight. Mark your calendars for the 2022 St. Louis Art Fair, taking place September 9th through the 11th. Go behind the art with HEC Media's Meet the Artist series at youtube.com slash meet the artists. My name is Marion Steen and I'm an abstract artist. I work predominantly in watercolor, but I do a lot of collage and mixed media work. I like to add strings and sticks and all kinds of things that I find when I'm walking or driving. And I've started adding collage mostly because I wanted dimension to my work. 
so the collage gives it a little bit of dimension. When I started watercolor years ago, I wanted my watercolors to be different because a lot of people were painting in watercolors and very typical landscapes, and so I wanted to go away from that a little bit. My style is predominantly abstract, although I do like to venture into painting flora and fauna. It all started quite realistically in very traditional watercolors, but I really wanted to veer away from that. And I also wanted to show emotion in my paintings. I like people to have their own feelings when they look at my paintings. And I once sold a painting to a man and he said, stop, don't tell me anything about your ideal when you painted that. He said, I have my own idea and I'm loving it and I don't want it to be disturbed. I think the key element that people are drawn to in my work is color. I love color. Sometimes I like to make it soft and quiet and calm and sometimes I like to have it be very bright and cheerful. I think that color reflects our emotions and I try to use that in my paintings. The St. Louis Art Fair is absolutely the best venue in the city. I love the St. Louis Art Fair and the people come in throngs and the nicest part about it is you meet the people that are purchasing your work or that are appreciating your work and you can talk about it. I'd like to invite you to come to the St. Louis Art Fair. Come to my booth and see my work and talk to me and I can explain how I do things there and you can enjoy the color and the festivities. It's a wonderful art fair. It's one of the best art fairs in the country. My name's Joey Gracie. I'm a wood sculptor. I specialize mostly in carved wooden panels, sculptures for the wall that mostly utilize scraps and cutoffs from sawmills and local cabinet shops. I grew up with woodworking. Uh, my dad had a shop, uh, was always building houses and doing things, not professionally, but so it's always something I was around. In college, I initially started with a business degree. Um, after three years, I decided to transfer to furniture design. After that, I worked in cabinet shops, sawmills, a variety of things, but always doing shows on the side. So eventually I started carving on my wooden vessels. And then eventually I kind of moved past the lathe and only started carving and sculpting and making pieces for the wall. Typically, for a piece, it starts at the sawmill, um, going through what material they have. I'm looking for certain characteristics in the wood, whether it be the way it's weathered, the way it's cracked or split, or if there's some kind of unique grain happening. After that, I'll bring it to my shop. And depending on the pieces, you know, it, it could, the piece could be a 10 by 10 by eight foot piece of hard maple that needs to get processed down. So I'll cut it and basically get the part that I want from that. After that, I'll do the carving uh, and I can use a variety of tools, grinding tools, chainsaw, uh, traditional gouges and hand tools. So after the carving, I'll either typically burn the wood to, to enhance the, the texturing. Sometimes I'll use stains also to also further the texture as well. And then after that happens, the piece totally dries, cracks, does whatever it wants, and then and it'll get finished from there. The reason I like woodworking, I, it's a conversation with the material more so than than just implying your point of view or your idea on something. You have to work with what you have, with what's available, and kind of let it talk back to you sometimes as well. So that that's my biggest inspiration, I think, is trying to find the best use for the piece of wood and not try to overpower it. I hope when people see my work, it kind of changes their perspective on what woodworking is, what I do, isn't woodworking in the traditional sense or even wood carving in the traditional sense. So I hope it, it changes their perspective on what's possible and what can be deemed fine wood art. 
It's the podcast for parents, teachers, and anyone interested in the education system. Classroom Matters, hosted by Educate.Today's Christy Hool. Find Classroom Matters on Educate.Today or wherever you get your podcasts. HEC has been bringing you positive programming and award-winning content for decades. Arts, education, culture, in-depth discussions, films, and more. All in one place. HECmedia.org. Internationally renowned author Salman Rushdie is recovering from serious stab wounds after being attacked during a lecture. The last time Sir Salman was in St. Louis, he spoke with HEC President Dennis Riggs about living under the constant threat of assassination, its impact on his life and work, and about the importance of America's freedom of speech. You paid quite a bit of a price for artistic expression with satanic verses and, and basically being underground for 10 years. How did that affect you personally and creatively? I think what happens to many people when they, when they find themselves in extreme situations is that they discover the ability to resist. You know, they discover in themselves the ability, the power of resistance and of survival. You know, and I discovered that I had a pretty well-functioning survival mechanism, I'm happy to say. Um, and it made me more determined than ever, if you like, to go on being the kind of writer I'd set out to be. You were afraid it might affect your writing? Yeah, I mean, it could have done all kinds of things, couldn't it? It could have paralyzed me and stopped me writing altogether. Um, it could have scared me into writing, you know, inoffensive, meek little books. Um, or it could have provoked me into writing, essentially, um, you know, vendetta books, revenge books. You know, And I thought all of those would have been elephant traps, you know, all of those are ways of simply becoming a creature of the attack and not re not retaining your own artistic individuality. And so I thought the thing to do is to avoid all of that, you know, and to try and just stay on your road, you know, try to go on being the writer you set out to be. You know, one of the great functions of literature has been to provoke in a positive way, you know, to say to make society ask itself questions um, that it might otherwise shy away from or uh, and to have a debate, you know, so you have a debate which, from which perhaps everyone learns something, everyone benefits, and you don't expect everyone to be on your side. And, you know, how could there be a debate if everyone was on your side? And at some point, did this threat against your life, the fatwa, uh, obscure that debate? Yeah, I mean, because the debate was happening, really, for, for the six months or so after the book came out. Um, that's exact. There were, there were no threats of violence. There was no, there was no you know, improper behavior. There were people strongly expressing their views for and against and somewhere in the middle, you know. Um, and I thought that was all quite constructive, you know. And then along came this, this sort of murderous um, piece of international terrorism and, it, and changed the subject. And, and in a way, the intellectual debate ended. And what replaced it was this argument about whether you should kill people for writing books, which, you know, my view is that you should not. <laughs> I share your view. Thank you very much. <laughs> you know, nothing is guaranteed. You have to you have to defend your principles. You know, the First Amendment is one of the great principles, and actually is one of the reasons why people like me like being in America. You know, that that, that principle of freedom. Um, but it seems to me very often it's not a principle that's defended or upheld, and it needs to be. You know, vehemently. If you infringe the right of a writer to write, you also infringe the right of a reader to read. You know, and I, I think we should all be able to choose the books we read without having that choice made for us by some third party, you know, of, of whatever political persuasion or religious persuasion. Watch the full interview with Salman Rushdie at atcmedia.org. HEC Media. Recognized. Celebrated. Honored time and again for excellence in the industry. HEC Media has been bringing home the hardware for over a decade. Arts and education to author talks, magazine shows and documentaries, individual craft achievements to overall excellence. Find all of the award-winning content at hecmedia.org. This story is brought to you in partnership with STL Made. People are really yearning for real uh, materials with character, with history. That's half of what sells these items, is the story. As a little kid, I wanted to be an architect. Went to architecture school and found that that wasn't really the place for me. I kind of had to rethink uh, what I was gonna do. 
When I came back to St. Louis, I think in my 20s, I uh, kind of fell back in love with the city and saw that there was uh, an even bigger need to divert uh, building materials from the landfill, get those materials into the hands of rehabbers, uh, and creative people, and to see less buildings just get crushed. Refab operates a 40,000 square foot warehouse in the Benton Park West neighborhood. Uh, and in that warehouse, we have 180 years of building material history uh, and items that you can buy. Uh, so sometimes it feels like a museum. Sometimes it uh, feels very much like a place where you can come and shop. We have hand-hewn logs from the 1840s. We have uh, hundreds of doors of all different styles and periods. We have windows. We have tons of reclaimed lumber, again, from all different periods. This is the place to come for materials for your older home. The big difference between deconstruction and uh, demolition is that with demolition, uh, it happens very fast. The building gets crushed. We use quite a bit more labor and it takes a lot longer for us to take a building down roof to foundation. So essentially we take out uh, interior components that are of value and then we rip off the roof and basically unbuild the house piece by piece. Instead of going to the landfill, it comes to us and it gets used for good purposes. I mean, great stuff comes out of this lab. Different things they do here with the wood is amazing. Three years ago, uh, we decided to refabricate materials and started making tabletops, countertops. You know, we're really getting our stuff out there into people's homes. It has been a great new venture for the organization. This is a perfect place to do salvage, right? This was a city that was built for a lot more people than live in St. Louis City. For those who are rehabbing buildings, um, we have an amazing stock of building materials. We've got some of the best bricks that were ever made. Same with the wood. Um, we have both the southern yellow pine, which is really popular, as well as you just get outside the city a little bit and you're taking down barns with amazing hardwoods because Missouri is known for that as well. So this is just a great city for salvage. It feels good to, to keep materials out of the landfill uh, and then to get to tell their story. To see someone find that exact piece that completes their house, that is always rewarding. Next week, local groups welcoming immigrants to town. Plus, art that calls attention to climate change. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.